much. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Alex Epstein. There you go. I come from the legacy broadcast world, and so more than 10 years of experience in that world, I feel that I am qualified to say that my industry at large does not understand energy, does not understand economics for the most part, and so combine those two does not understand energy economics. And so we're going to be talking about a couple of things, but I want to first introduce Alex for those of you not familiar with him. He is a philosopher and energy expert who argues that human flourishing should be the guiding principle of energy and environmental progress. He's the author of the new best-selling book, Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less. I read this book recently, and some facts that I derived from it is that 80% of the world's energy is powered by fossil fuels. We need more energy, not less. And yes, the climate is getting warmer. But is that a catastrophe? Our knowledge system says yes. And that's where I want to start. Because you start your book with a discussion about our quote unquote knowledge system and its designated experts. So tell us about that. What did you learn about the knowledge system and the experts that the public is really relying on, including our politicians and media? Hey everyone, so thanks, thanks first of all for having me. Thanks Natalie for, for doing this and for, for reading the book. Yeah, so this, this idea of knowledge system I think is a very valuable concept that I, I came up with to solve what I think is a big problem that we almost never discuss. And, and this is the problem of reliable expert knowledge. So there are two facts I think are indisputably true. So one is that we need expert knowledge to make good decisions, whether you're talking about energy, climate, COVID, you need specialists, which is really what an expert is, to help you. But then the other thing that's indisputable is often, quote unquote, listening to the experts is disastrous. So doing what we're told the experts say has been disastrous throughout history. I mean, you had consensus of experts who supported slavery, eugenics, uh, many of us would say, you know, bad COVID policies. Certainly, I think all of you would believe bad monetary policy, which I would agree with. And so there's this question of how do we get the benefit of expert knowledge without, without going wrong as people do when they uncritically rely on it. And I think the key is understanding that when we're told something is expert knowledge, that's the product of a four-part system. And I'll just explain it quickly, but it's, I call it the knowledge system. So there are four parts. So there's researchers, uh, synthesizers, disseminators, and evaluators. And, so research, and, and the key is each one of these parts can go wrong. And so the researchers are the people who are doing the direct study of the area. So for example, in climate, you have climate researchers. And when people hear, oh, you disagree with the consensus that we should get rid of fossil fuels, they think, oh, you must disagree with the climate researchers. But that's actually not true. What I overwhelmingly disagree with are the three phases after that. And so, for example, we have synthesizers in the realm of climate. This is called the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They take all of the research and synthesize it. And when you do that, you can make huge errors. And one thing I think that's obvious once you know the facts is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change totally evades the fact that we are far safer than ever from climate. This is a documented fact. We have a 98% decline in climate-related disaster deaths that's clearly related to fossil fuels, which do things like power irrigation and heating and cooling and building sturdy buildings. And yet the IPCC doesn't say anything about the decline in climate deaths or fossil fuels beneficial role. So that's like a report on polio that doesn't mention we're safer than ever from polio and doesn't talk about the benefits of the polio vaccine. So there's a failure of synthesis. The next thing is dissemination. So even once you have these organizations synthesize the information, this is your field, journalism, how does it get disseminated to the general public? And this is the one where we're most familiar. Synth disseminators do a terrible job and it's totally true in climate, for example, you hear like an Al Gore will tell you, hey, scientists say sea levels are going to rise by 20 feet soon. And actually, the extreme projections in the literature are three feet in 100 years. So you get those kinds of distortions. And then the biggest distortions are the evaluation. So that's once you have a given set of facts or you think are facts, how do you evaluate what to do about them? And in this case, what I noticed that really made me decide to go in this field is when people are talking about fossil fuels, they overwhelmingly focus on the negative climate side effects of fossil fuels and ignore the huge benefits. And so when you're looking at any field, you can ask, hey, are people evaluating in this in a way that makes sense? Even if they have all the facts right, is their method right? 
And you can ask, are the disseminators doing their job? And do I think the synthesizers are doing their job? And I think that can help you spot a lot of bad things. And then that can help you find better experts. Well, it's interesting how pervasive some of these narratives are, how powerful they are. And in your book, you cite examples from the 70s and 80s of the mainstream knowledge system predicting that we were actually going to have a catastrophic resource depletion and even an ice age, a catastrophic global cooling, which obviously turned out to be wrong. So what do you think that the knowledge system got wrong in the past? And what does it mean for today's predictions of global catastrophic warming? So, so just one note about this. I think I'm glad you bring up these predictions. And the reason I bring them up is if you're trusting a knowledge system in a given field, one thing you can do to assess it is ask what is its track record? What predictions did it make in the past and what prescriptions did it make in the past? And when it comes to the environmental impacts of industry, our knowledge system is an unmitigated failure because it has predicted for the last 50 years that industry would have environmental impacts that were so catastrophic and self-destructive that life would regress. And yet the world is a far better place than ever for human flourishing. And so there's a question when people predict catastrophic resource depletion, catastrophic pollution, catastrophic global cooling, then catastrophic global warming, which even though we've had global warming, we're actually safer than ever from climate because our ability to adapt to our what I call master climate is far more significant than any adverse changes from warming. When this happens, you really have to ask what's going on. So on a superficial level, they're ignoring the benefits of fossil fuels and other industry. They're ignoring all the ways in which we make our environment better, like how we clean our water, how we produce new resources, how we master climate. But then at a deeper level, I think, there's a false assumption many people have, which we were talking about in advance of this, I call the delicate nurturer assumption. And this is the view that Earth exists in a delicate nurturing balance that our impact ruins. And the more you have this assumption, the more you expect our impact to be catastrophic, and the less you can see benefit in our impact. So that's a very deep assumption. And then I also think, and this is the most controversial, I think that many of our leading thinkers have anti-human values. I think that when they think of the Earth, they're not evaluating it by the standard of, is the Earth a better place for human flourishing? They're evaluating it by the standard of, does the Earth have as little human impact as possible? And I think you can see this with climate. Most people will say, hey, we've ruined our climate, we've destroyed our climate, and yet we're safer than ever from climate. So if we're safer than ever from climate, how can you view it as destroyed? Because you're not a, either you're ignorant, but the experts aren't. They're on a non-human standard. So their view is a bad climate is one we've impacted a lot. Whereas on my standard, a, a bad climate is one that's really dangerous. So our one degree Celsius warmer climate that we can master is a way better climate than the natural one that used to exist. So, and a lot of my focus in my work is, I think our experts overwhelmingly are not evaluating this issue on the standard of human flourishing. And to use a, um, an analogy by the great economist George Reisman, listening to somebody who's against human impact on this kind of issue is like listening to a doctor who's on the side of the germs. If they're not, if they're not, if they don't have a human standard by which they're measuring things, you cannot trust anything they say to benefit you because their goal is not to benefit you, it's to eliminate your impact. And if somebody said, hey, I want to eliminate bear impact, you'd say, hey, this guy wants to kill all the bears. But we have a global movement that says we want to eliminate human impact and everyone thinks that somehow doesn't mean we want to harm humans, but it, it, that's what it, it means. Well, we often look at this from such a lens of privilege, right, especially here in the West. But something you point out in the book is the fact that billions of people still don't have access to low-cost, reliable energy. They use less electricity or energy than what powers a refrigerator here in the U.S. And yet so many of our political leaders, advocacy groups, environmentalists, and central banks want to move rapidly to remove fossil fuels and go to renewables. What are they missing? Well, uh, they're missing a lot of what, what you just said and what you said from the outset. So if you're thinking of the world from a human perspective and you know anything about the value of energy, and the basic value of energy is, I call it machine food or machine calories. What it enables us, enables us to do is use machines to produce way more value than we can using manual labor. So basically, everyone in this room has approximately, you guys might be richer than average, but if you're just average, uh, 75 machine servants working for you at all times, right? So machines are doing almost all the work, including a lot of types of work that we can't do. So if I wasn't a premature baby, but I'm sure there are many people in here who were, like, the, you wouldn't be alive without an incubator. Human beings without machines cannot incubate other human beings. We cannot fly, those of you who flew here. So machines are amplifying and expanding our ability. 
and three quarters of the world uses an amount of energy that we would consider totally unacceptable. So when you look at it from that perspective of the world is energy starved, it should seem bizarre that the overwhelming focus of the world right now is rapidly eliminating the form of energy that provides 80% of the energy that we need far more of, and particularly, you'll notice, it's growing. And fossil fuel use is particularly growing in the parts of the world that care most about cost-effective energy, namely China, which is also using a lot of fossil fuels to produce solar and wind. So this narrative that solar and wind are so good that we can get away with rapidly eliminating fossil fuels in 27 years, that was a bizarre narrative, and that narrative unfortunately caused a global energy crisis. Well, that's the perfect place for my next question. Let's talk about this energy crisis that we're seeing. We haven't even reduced fossil fuel use. We're seeing more of it around the world, and we have energy shortages. And we ironically have people in Europe worried about the winter and about the cold amid this energy crisis. So what are your thoughts and where are we headed in the near term? I mean, so, so one thing I think it's important is there, were, there was a group of us who was saying that this was obviously going to happen. If you recognize the world needs far more energy, there's something uniquely cost-effective about fossil fuels, at least in the near term. To, that's why people are using it everywhere, even when, like Japan, you wouldn't expect them to. But there's, there's a lot of special things about fossil fuels that we can talk about. But if you realize demand is going to grow, the world needs far more of it, it, it was obvious that if you suppress the supply, you're going to have skyrocketing prices. And as you pointed out, this is the scary thing about the net zero movement. Their goal has been to have fossil fuel use way, way lower by now than it is. It was supposed to have dramatically decreased by now. What has actually happened is they've slowed the rate of increase. So by opposing fossil fuel investment, fossil fuel production, fossil fuel transportation, fossil fuel refining, they've slowed the rate of growth. And that has been enough to cause a global energy crisis because all of these alleged expert promises about unreliable solar and wind rapidly replacing fossil fuels have come totally false. And the embodiment of this is Europe, uh, which is just, is just a perfect story of what not to do. We had fracking, which is the most actually successful energy technology the last 20 years come online. The US validated it and Europe just preemptively banned it Throughout Europe, they also did not secure supplies of energy of fossil fuels from free countries because they didn't think they would need them. Uh, so it's just incredibly irresponsible. And we need to recognize that this is a failed, this is a failed approach. And, and in particular, it is a failure to be a fossil fuel benefit denier. You cannot make decisions by denying the benefits of something and only looking at the negative side effects. And that unfortunately typifies most of our so-called experts. Well, we've slowed the growth by issuing more debt, right? Going further and further into debt here in the West. And I think it's an interesting time to bring in Bitcoin to this conversation because Bitcoin obviously uses energy. Although I always like to point people to what Lynn Alden has said, which is that in terms of the world's energy use, it's really a rounding error because when they estimate how much energy the world and technology and equipment uses around the world, it can literally be off by several percentage points, whereas Bitcoin uses less than one-tenth of one percent. So um, before we talk about a little bit about how Bitcoin is uh, incentivizing renewables, let's just talk about Bitcoin energy, because you touched on Bitcoin a little bit in your book. Yeah, so, so my basic message to the Bitcoin world, which I've long been a fan of and philosophically allied with ever since I learned with, about it in 2011, and I've, I was against, way against fiat money before it was cool to be against uh, fiat money. So uh, I, love, you know, I love the Bitcoin, I love the approach of it, uh, but what I think is a mistake that people have made is to have guilt around the issue of energy use. And here's the thing. Energy is, you know, as Doomberg, if you follow that account, they, they say energy is life. It, I think more accurately, like energy is ability. What energy does is it allows us to have more ability to flourish on a very inhospitable planet. And when we use energy, that means we're using machines to produce value to benefit our lives. So when you're using Bitcoin, when it's using energy, that's using machines to create value to enrich human life. That's something to be proud of, not to be ashamed of. And I think you should look at my overall argument, which is that the benefits of fossil fuels far outweigh any negative side effects, including climate side effects. You should have the same view for Bitcoin. Like, I'm proud to use this energy because I'm creating tremendous value. I think that should be the number one attitude, not, oh, it's too small, or it's not, not big. Well, we've heard from other people at this conference about how Bitcoin is improving energy economics for solar and wind. There are some areas that have negative energy prices right yeah, now. Yeah, well, that, that I, I, can I talk about that for a second? Sure. So I want to be 
I want to caution you again. So the solar and wind world is full of fraud. Like we just have to be really straightforward about the nature of this. And I am not somebody who's philosophically opposed to solar and wind or alternatives to fossil fuels. I want as many alternatives as quickly as possible because I think the world is energy poor. I'm particularly an advocate of decriminalizing nuclear energy because it has the fundamentals that have made fossil fuels successful. It's highly concentrated. It's naturally stored energy, which with solar wind aren't, which leads to a whole bunch of problems. And it's naturally very abundant. So I am not against solar and wind succeeding, but the way solar and wind have succeeded so far is overwhelmingly through government coercion. And there's mandates of them, there's huge subsidies, but the main thing people overlook is that all the grids are rigged because they have this insane policy of paying the same for unreliable electricity from solar and wind as they do for reliable electricity. This is like you go to a car rental place and you pay the same for a car that works a third of the time and you don't know when versus a car that works all the time. So we have total discrimination against reliable sources of energy on the government managed grids. So, and part of what Bitcoin people have done in practice is they buy these things called power purchase agreements, which are mostly a scam in terms of how they're set up. And then they say, oh, we used all renewable, which this is how Apple claims to be 100% renewable. They just take credit for everyone else's renewable, so-called, and they give them the blame for their coal, oil, and gas. So Bitcoin, I think, is a very honest technology. Don't engage in scams. Do not do that. If you want to engage honestly with solar and wind, if you really think that you can deal with like the peaks of solar and wind and you can absorb them, that's plausible. All the art articles I've read on this are sloppy in terms of actually making an economically good case. I know this isn't making pop me popular with a lot of you guys, but you have to be really, really rigorous. And I would say, make sure you adopt the most rigorous energy thinking, not the most convenient energy thinking, because you will get slammed by people who know what they're doing if you claim, oh, Bitcoin is all solar and wind. That said, Bitcoin has a lot of opportunity, I think, to innovate in new forms of energy, particularly because you can do it in remote places. I know we have some people in OTEC, which I wish them the best. There's people in Bitcoin and nuclear with flared gas, even solar and wind. I think there's potential, but I've seen, I've seen so many false statements from the Bitcoin community about solar and wind, and please don't join that racket, only engage with it honestly. Well, where should people get honest information? Because I know that one area of focus is this renewable energy side, and, and people driving toward solar and wind, saying that Bitcoin mining, because it can, it's location agnostic, can actually help these types of initiatives move forward, make them economically feasible, because they can go in when the power is intermittent and supply the grid and, and meet that supply demand. But you're kind of saying, well, not I'm hold, saying hold your horses. I'm saying it's plausible under certain circumstances, but you just have to be aware that of how the grid works. So, I mean, my own resource, which I've created for a lot of this stuff, is energytalkingpoints.com, where that's kind of clear explanations of just about everything, and we need to put out some, some more Bitcoin points soon to, to deal with these things. Uh, but you just have to be aware that the grid is a government-controlled thing that has irrational, unfair pricing policies that favor solar and wind, which is part of the reason it's declining around the country. And just look for things, look for things where they're honestly creating something more cost-effective versus exploiting somebody else. And, and whenever you're dealing with the grid, you just need to be aware it is very easy to come up with policies that exploit other people because we are all collectivized into this system that's run by the government according to, in my view, mostly irrational rules. Well, you mentioned the potential of nuclear. I know there are a lot of people here that wish to see more nuclear power, especially when it comes to Bitcoin mining. But why has it been shunned by so many environmentalists and governments? So this is a great question. You could ask the same thing of hydro. Why is there a lot of opposition to hydro in the environmental movement? Like the Sierra Club celebrates shutting down dams, even though you would think that the environmental movement would love it because it's generating a lot of energy at relatively low cost without the CO2 emissions and without other uh, harmful, you know, without, without harmful environmental uh, impacts. So I think the, th the core, and this, this really justifies my analysis, that the core of the modern environmental movement is a hostility toward human impact as such, not a genuine concern about the adverse consequences of CO2 emissions. Because the modern environmental movement is the movement that has led what I call the criminalization of nuclear. So nuclear is basically a criminal enterprise today. You are treated as engaging in the most dangerous activity on the planet. You're guilty until proven innocent. You need to follow these very carefully uh, prescribed things by a government that has a so-called nuclear regulatory agency that since 1975, its inception, has not approved one plant from conception to completion. So it's the nuclear criminalization 
commission, one of my big projects with energy talking points, and I work with 170 plus political offices, is in the next four years really working on nuclear decriminalization legislation. But unless that is changed, nuclear will continue to be the energy tragedy that it has been for the last 50 years. Well, I think given the energy crisis, there's going to be more of a narrative that goes against Bitcoin. There might be a war on Bitcoin and its energy use. And I think one of the things that Jeff Booth has brought up that I think is very compelling and poignant is this idea of meeting people where they are. There are a lot of really well-intentioned people who don't have the knowledge that maybe you do about energy at large. And they want to save the planet. They want to do something right by their communities. So how do we meet them where they are and tell them about Bitcoin energy use and its climate impact. So I hope this is useful for other things besides this. I'll tell you how I do it in energy. And then I, I think there are similar things that will be useful for, for Bitcoin in particular than other things you guys are interested in. But I think the most important thing in persuasion is to be aware of the, the concept I call framework. And I talk about this a lot in chapter uh, 11 of the book in terms of how to use it persuasively and then part one a lot about the, the philosophy of it. But you can think of a framework as a starting structure. So just like this, this has a starting structure that determines so many things about it. Every thought, every person is operating on a certain framework. And in particular, they're operating with certain thinking methods. They have certain assumptions about cause and effect, and they hold certain values. And I've mentioned today, most people are using the thinking method of evaluating fossil fuels by only looking at negative side effects, not benefits. Most people are on the assumption that the Earth is a delicate nurturer versus what I think is the true assumption, which is that it is wild potential that our impact generally improves. And then most people are inadvertently looking at the Earth and energy in terms of eliminating human impact versus advancing human flourishing. And if you're aware of people's framework, then in conversation, you can try to quickly establish your own framework if people are open to it. And the easiest thing is on the thinking methods. In almost every conversation I ever have, I very quickly start with, hey, do you agree we should carefully weigh the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels just as we would a prescription drug? And you might be shocked at how effective that is, because here's the thing, nobody has ever said no. Nobody will say, hey, I'm just going to look at the side effects, not the benefits. Nobody will say that, but everyone does it. So whenever you have a situation where common sense is not common practice, if you make the common sense thing explicit, then it is much more likely to be practiced. So in the book, I talk a bunch about framing, but framing is the most important thing. And then maybe the other important thing, is I've studied a lot of persuasion. I mean, I have arguably the hardest issue in the world to convince people of, because everyone thinks science tells them I'm exactly wrong. And at this point, I've definitely influenced millions of people to think more rationally. And I've had to discover a lot about persuasion along the way, not because I wanted to be a persuasion guru, but because I unfortunately believed something was true that most people thought was insane, which I wish were not the case. I, I don't want to be contrarian. I just think most people happen to be wrong on this one. I, would, I will be very happy when people change their minds. But another key concept uh, for persuasion is what I call context bridging. And this relates to meeting people where they are. And so just think of everyone as having a context, which means a sum of things they know, think they know, and have heard. So what do they know that you believe is true? What do they think they know? And what have they heard? And you, they have a context. They're starting from a certain place about fossil fuels or Bitcoin or anything else. And then you, that's like context A. And then you have context B. You want to get them to a certain place. And I call this context bridging. You have to think about what knowledge do I have to add? What knowledge do I need to subtract? And what do I need to modify? So in this case, I might need to add that climate-related deaths are at all-time lows. Most people don't know that. I might need to subtract that solar and wind are rapidly replacing fossil fuels. That's not happening. And I might need to modify, hey, climate change is real, but that doesn't mean it's catastrophic. And so if you have this model in your head of context A, context B, how do I build them step by step? I think you'll be shocked at how effective you can be. And the, the most effective way of bridging is framing, is giving them a method or an assumption or value that they agree with, because that'll change so many things on its own. Well, I want to wrap up on a note of hope, because for so many people, Bitcoin is hope. And when you hear these words, you know, global catastrophe, that the climate is about to destroy the planet, we're not going to have a livable environment, that's all very, very negative. And we do have these deadlines set by political leaders and central banks saying we have to get to net zero by a certain time when they're missing some of that context that you're just talking about. But you actually are hopeful. You're hopeful about where this is moving. You talk about it at the end of your book. Why are you hopeful that we're going to move in the right direction when it comes to energy use and understanding it? 
So, so one thing to just be hopeful about baseline is we are the luckiest people who have ever existed in the history of this planet, like without question, and we just need whatever problems we observe, and there are many, like we need to recognize how fortunate we are. One of the tragedies of Greta Thunberg is she thinks she's the unluckiest human being who ever lived, and she's actually the luckiest, leaving aside the psychology that she got from really bad education and miseducation and indoctrination. So one thing I hope people get from my work is just the world is amazing and generally getting better, but then you actually see right now, it's only been regressing in some ways in the past couple of years because of lack of freedom in general and then energy in particular. That's what's actually stopped things from improving. So that's the negative, but the positive is that Two things give me confidence. One is that people are really aware of this energy issue and open to new ideas because we have a crisis. And it's clearly a lack of fossil fuel crisis. And clearly the people who said, let's rapidly get rid of fossil fuels, don't worry about it. Those people were clearly wrong. So I find people more open than ever. And then the other thing is that what I've been doing in a select other group of other people like Michael Schellenberger, Bjorn Lomborg, Steve Koonin, I call us energy humanists because we look at the big picture positives and negatives of fossil fuels from a human perspective, we've been getting so much traction and also we've, we've just created a set of arguments that didn't exist even 10 years ago, let alone 15 years ago when I started. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend, uh, Fossil Future is great if you can get it, it costs $20, so I understand if you don't want to, but energytalkingpoints.com, that website, that basically has my brain and research downloaded for free. And some people have come up to me and said, hey, I just keep that as an open tab on my browser. Try doing that, try subscribing to the newsletter because we have so much better knowledge and arguments right now and basically you always want to use the high leverage thing. So if you know people are open, find the best arguments. I think it's, it's mine honestly, but find the best arguments and share those. You have an unlimited printing press with the internet. We have open minds and the best resources and the other side really has no answer to all of this. If you look at how they attack me, they really have nothing. So that's what makes me optimistic. I think it is really important to look at both sides, weigh the benefits, weigh the risks, weigh the negatives as well. And uh, Alex Epstein, I, I really thank you so much because we do need more energy. This is going to be a constant battle for us to, to educate people. And I think it is something that's really, really difficult to understand for the average person. So thank you for what you're doing to educate the space. Thank you. And I have, um, if anyone wants them, I have I Love Fossil Fuels pin, so I'll hang out somewhere around there. And you can, I have about 150 of them. And if you want to come say hi, uh, that'd be great as well.